Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for allowing us to continue uh, the study of your Word together. We are so grateful, Lord, that we can look at these chapters and these verses and find comfort and grace, knowing that there is no judgment for those who are in Christ, that all of our judgment fell on Christ, who died in our place. I would ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at Blessed Hope Forever Again, and at precisely 12.12 12 a.m. on 12.12 12 of 2019, that was December the 12th of uh, 2019, the moon officially became a full moon. It was the last full moon of the decade. Right before entering 2020, which was a, a most interesting, to say the least, year, uh, 12 is a very interesting number. We know that in Scripture. There's 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, 12 gates. Uh, uh, there's uh, 12 angels, 12 hours on a clock, 12 jurors. Uh, there's the significance of the word dozen. You know, uh, my mother, God rest her soul. You know, if I've told you once, I've told you a dozen times. You know, 12, 12, 12. 12 is a, is a fascinating number. Uh, the, the middle of Revelation, basically, uh, is chapter 12. Chapter 12 covers a, a period of time from Christ's birth into the uh, Great Tribulation period. There's 12 main characters mentioned in the book, if you can actually believe that. 12 main characters, uh, as well as 12 locations. I counted them. At least that's what I come up with. You may you may come up with 11 or 13, but that's what I I, I counted. There's t actually 12 notable numbers. Uh, 12 represents God's power and divine authority. We know that. That's 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 what the main one of the main themes of the Book of Revelation. It's the 66th book of the Bible. Those two digits uh, total 12, and and these are just facts, mathematical facts. You can kind of, you know, make whatever you want of them. Uh, but uh, I find it interesting that there, there are also 12,000 words in the authorized version of the book of Revelation, 12,000 words. I, you know, you, if you want to think that's a coincidence, be my guest. I, I have a hard time doing that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Now, in, in chapter 7, we looked at the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, and, and there's all kinds of reasons given for, for why God decided to choose 12,000. And I told you what I believe that means. It, it, it means uh, 12,000, that he chose 12,000. And these were sealed. Now, you and I were sealed when we were born again. This, this is not the church. Uh, but Israel. Uh, in verse 3 of chapter 7, I believe it was verse 3, verse 3 of uh, chapter 7, uh, we saw that they are said to be, these sealed ones are said to be the servants of God. In verse 9, we read, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, the fact that this great multitude is mentioned in such close proximity to these servants of God, to me, that indicates that this great multitude was a result of their ministry. It was a result of their service. At least that's the way I'm looking at that. We saw that these 144,000 who were um, not to be hurt, they went forth spreading the gospel of the kingdom to all the world. That's the gospel of the kingdom that's preached during the tribulation period 
uh, distinct from the gospel that we preach today. And we are now looking at chapter 8. Chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, And when he had opened the seal, the seventh seal, uh, so now we, we see the seventh seal open, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. That's in verse 2, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. If we continue on reading in verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, and he filled it. He filled it with fire of the altar, and he cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And now we begin to look at the first four trumpets. As I mentioned uh, previously, I believe I, I pointed out that I'm persuaded that this silence draws our attention back to an important factor in Israel's history, the incense and the worship of God in the temple. That was offered, uh, they offered, the priest offered it before and after uh, the eve, before the and after uh, the sacrifices, or that while the sacrifices were made, the voices, the the instruments, the, and, and the trumpets sounded. But while the priest went into the temple to burn the incense, they were all silent, and the people that were outside the temple who were not allowed to go inside the temple, they prayed outside the temple they prayed in silence or to themselves and I uh, drew your attention to Luke cha chapter 1 which I've, I found ex extremely interesting because it talks about uh, Zacharias uh, the, he was a he was a priest and uh, he had a, a wife named Elizabeth of course she was barren they had a child the child was John the Baptist, okay? And there's where it gets interesting. John the Baptist. What was it that John the Baptist preached what, during Christ's earthly ministry? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. Behold, the kingdom of, you know, the Lamb of God, you know, the kingdom of Christ is at hand. It was, uh, many Christians out there fail to understand that important distinction between Israel and the church. Christ came offering the kingdom. If they had accepted it, of course we know that they would not have because it was not in God's design that they do so. And that there is, well, that, that could, I could devote an entire video to God's sovereign uh, de determination that they not, even though the offer was made, it was so that the age of grace could be ushered in, that salvation could come to the Gentiles, Israel would be set aside in unbelief, but, but it, th there would have never been any crucifixion, folks. Christ would have never died, okay? And, and would have never been buried, would have never rose from the dead. Uh, there, would have, we would just, there would be no church. If Israel had accepted their Messiah, you can just leave the church out of all of this, okay? We're just, we don't, we don't exist. We would have never existed, okay? It's not hard to understand that. And we have to understand that. But we see that in this passage concerning, you know, what we just read here, that there, there is silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. We see that it has a direct correlation to... John the Baptist. 
and the, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, which is what occurs during Daniel's 70th week or the period that we know is the tribulation period, uh, the, the, the time of Jacob's trouble. It was because of John the Baptist that it was it was said that 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 he will go before Christ in the spirit of, in the power of Elijah and he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and uh, that's just what will happen during the tribulation period. Didn't happen then. It's going to happen soon. I believe soon. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord which is exactly, exactly what the two witnesses, as well as the sealed 144,000 servants of God do in their preaching the gospel of the kingdom as John the Baptist did, which results in multitudes which no man can number being redeemed. Okay? Very interesting. So now in verse 6, Verse 6, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. It appears to me that the tribulation period is never said to begin until the 144,000 are sealed. That there's a bouncing back and forth uh, here in Revelation. It's not linear. It's not chronological. Uh, John has different visions. Uh, separate visions, many of them which are similar uh, and could be comparative uh, to one another, uh, but also in which there are distinctions. And we have to study, really apply ourselves to not, to, under, to, to see that th this is not a, you know, a, a written account of everything that's going to happen in the near future which happens were that everything happens in succession so now the seven trumpets are about to sound and the prayers of the saints are uh, these angels they filled they they filled it those prayers with the fire of the altar and they cast it into the earth. Uh, the prayers of the saints and the sealing of God's servants in their foreheads, in their foreheads, they were sealed in their forehead. And, uh, you know, I get myself in trouble every time I, I, I uh, try to I don't know, slaughter some sacred cow, or I, I try to uh, even suggest, uh, often when I suggest what I believe the text to be saying, it, it's often met, met with immediate resistance. Well, Steve, they've got a mark in their forehead. And that's, now, uh, that may be true, folks, and if, and if that's the position that you want to take, I'm not going to fault you for that. I'm not. You may be right. You know, whether they're going around with Sharpies, you know, or, you know, Mark. It says that God placed the, the, the seal in their forehead, that God did that. Okay? Not man, not... It's not... I don't believe it's some tattoo of, of some kind or a birthmark, or, or anything else like that. When I looked at the word, okay, metopon is the word in the Greek for, for forehead. What that word basically means is it means after the eye. Okay? So I take that as being not a literal mark of some kind, but I take that, folks, as spiritual discernment. The spiritual eyes of these sealed servants, they're not lying to them as to what's going on and what, what is about to occur. 
just as the church, okay, is said to be able to discern the things of the Spirit. Why? Because we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That, to me, sounds more sensible than the idea that this is, this is some sort of tattoo. You know, uh, I believe that, that, well, let me just say this. You know, people can say that that is a, a, a physical, literal mark, okay, that's, that's visible and, and all of that, which I do not believe. But it, to me, folks, it's ideas like that that, that fail to, it's, I'm just going to take the simple way out and I'm just going to say it's something that's written on their forehead. We don't know what it is. We know God did it. We don't know what it says. We, we don't know anything except that there's a mark there and that, that's, that's good enough for me. Okay? Folks, that's not good enough for me. Uh, I, I, I am drawing a connection between the mark that they have and the seal that, that God's given them, and the seal that God has given the church. What is the seal? We know it's a seal of ownership and, and protection, okay? doesn't guarantee you that you won't die in a plane crash, but it, it is God's spiritual protection that He guards His own. He guards His sheep. But it's more than that. It is uh, the fact that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit strongly infers that we are able to discern the things of the Spirit. The natural man cannot do that. The, man, the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness to him. But that's not the case with us. I believe that these ones who are sealed, they know who they are. They know they belong to Him. They know that God is their protector. They see what's going on. They're, they're awake to what is happening, okay? That's the seal. You, would, you probably wouldn't, if you were in the tribulation period and you walked up to one, you wouldn't know if he was one of the sealed or not. There's no literal mark there. It's But they, God has marked them with that seal. That's what I'm suggesting. You don't have to agree with me. In fact, you're probably safe if you don't. But it's my job to just tell you what I think. And so that's, that's what I think. Now, I found it interesting when I went through and I looked at uh, the, that word, metopon, the forehead. There's eight references. They're all in the book of Revelation. Four have to do with, with our being sealed or, or God's saints being sealed, whether it's, whether it's us being sealed or those in, in the tribulation period being sealed. There's four that have to do with God's people, and there are four that have to do with the non-elect. Four and four. Even score. I just want to pass that along. Found that interesting. Now in, uh, in chapter... Uh, 7 verse 9. Uh, let me just go ahead and read verses 7 through, or verses 9 through, 9 through 17 of chapter 7. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, and I believe that you, we would have to consider. Israel, along with all those nations, and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. I, I do not believe that they all died in the Great Tribulation period, but they did, they did come out of it because many of them will, many of them must enter alive into the kingdom Folks, you have to have some repopulate the kingdom where they then die and go to heaven, in which case they would be resurrected at the second coming of Christ. That's the, that's, we know that from the order of the res, God's program of resurrection. The order 
in which the resurrections occur. And verse 10 says, And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Uh, now let me just let me let me go on reading here in verse eleven, I believe. Verse eleven, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory, and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> this appears to be a glimpse into eternity where that they are all in glorified bodies. All of them. We read in verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these, or who are these, which are arrayed in white robes? And, uh, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Now in the Greek, you see the word is art articulated, the great tribulation. So they've come out of the great tribulation and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They will, folks, they can and they will, they come out of that period one way or another. They'll either, either through death or by, or, uh, by being among the blessed Blessed are they that make it to the 13, 35 days. That's from the midpoint to the kingdom. Uh, so the kingdom will be populated by those who survive. We know, we know that many survive because at that time God separates the sheep from the goats. If, if, if no one survived, I mean, that would be really odd. Uh, of course, I don't know anybody who be actually believes that. There have to be survivors. So, therefore, they are before the throne of God and they serve Him day and night. Okay? And uh, God will dwell among them. So, uh, verse 16, uh, continuing on in verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is, was, which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Reminds me of the movie Titanic, you know, where the... the the, pre the preacher was hanging on, you know, to the to the ship as it was going down, and uh, that was part of the the revelation that he was quoting. Uh, tears. Uh, you know. Now there are some. Who believe? I know I've read commentators who have suggested that these tears are tears of comparison. In fact, that may even be the the most common, the popular uh, take on this. That is, that they're they're tears of gratitude, tears of joy. Okay, for all that Christ did, as as compared to how filthy that they were. You know the, you know they they stand before God. At, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, knowing that they're only there because of what He did and, and what He did alone. And, and they compare that to how rotten and sinful and filthy that they were and, and how that they could, not, could never have uh, uh, done anything to merit uh, the, the salvation of God. So, so they, they cry. And, and that seems to be the popular opinion. And I do not believe that. I don't believe it. I know it sounds great, but that's not what I believe. Uh, when we stand before God in heaven, folks, there will be no tears. 
There won't be any sorrow at that time. No pain, no sorrow. Therefore, I have to conclude that this is speaking of uh, uh, when he, he wipes away all of their tears, okay, they, these individuals that this is speaking of, they are in the kingdom period. They've survived the tribulation period. They are alive in, in, in they went into the kingdom to populate the kingdom, but the kingdom is a thousand years long. Their lifespan is going to ensure that they die at some time sometime inside that millennial age, probably not long after they've survived this. And uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to suggest here is that these will enter into eternity through death in as millennial saints they were tribulation saints they entered into the kingdom they 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 became kingdom age saints they died a natural death died inside the tribulation the uh, kingdom period uh There, there will be multiple general. I mean, there's a multitude, okay, who will enter into eternity through death during that thousand years. Uh, as well as, well, I guess I suppose you can conclude, you, you could in, include every saint, okay? This is a multitude so great that no man could number. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm explaining this very well. Um, Both the, the great tribulation saints who died, okay, are being seen in heaven, as well as kingdom age saints who died are seen in heaven. And the, the wiping away of all tears from their eyes, to me, I'm going to suggest, and you don't have to agree with this, but I'm going to suggest that that wiping away our tears is not, to, I, to, I have a very, I'm just telling you, I have a very difficult time taking that as an event that occurs in eternity, in a glorified state, in a glorified body, in which there's no pain, no sorrow, no, just pure joy, pure contentment. That's what I'm saying. Uh, so, uh, the first four trumpets. I, I want to talk about uh, the first one. Uh, it's probably all I can I can talk about in in this particular video here today. The first four trumpets uh, affect natural objects: the the earth, the, the trees, the grass, the sea, rivers, fountains, the light of the sun, moon, and stars. The last three trumpets have to do with men's lives, uh, pain, death, hell, uh, that sort of thing. So you can see that differentiation there. And according to the research that I've done, the language is, is of this first trumpet is definitely, most likely, more than likely, I'd say, it's drawn from the plagues of Egypt. Hail is usually a symbol of God's wrath or vengeance. Exodus chapter 9. And the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. If we go over to Psalm chapter 105 uh, regarding the plagues on, on Egypt, He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land, and in Psalms 78, he gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. And then most of you are probably familiar with Job. Uh, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow or hast thou seen the treasure of the hail 
which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. The question still remains, are we, are we looking at something figurative here or are we looking at something literal? Uh, by the trees being burned up. Now, you know, some, some have suggested that this is a reference to the trees are great and noble, mighty men, princes and so, kings and so on and so, so forth. Rich men, okay, uh, uh, who are in Scripture, they're actually compared to trees. Uh, Isaiah 2, uh, we read, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. Uh, the 19th verse reads, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He arises to shake terribly the earth. You know, these, these things, they all sound like, you know, these Old Testament references, they all sound like what we've read here in Revelation. In Zechariah, we see actually see green grass being referred to as as uh, us ordinary common folk, you know, us, us, you know, those of us who are not noble, mighty, rich, whatever. Isaiah 55 is interesting. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never, I've never seen a, a hill break uh, break into singing but, uh, music songs I've never I've never seen hills sing songs and I and I've never seen uh, trees that actually clap so it's obviously comparing trees to people is what I wanted to point out here in job 5 the verses that I read reveal that this this occurs mostly when a country is is overrun invaded overrun uh, uh, plundered by an enemy. Uh, verse 5 I found interesting. In famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it comes. At destruction in famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. And I I pointed out, I believe, in a in a past video, how I believe that the, the beasts doesn't refer to literal animals, but uh, a, a beast uh, men with a beast uh, bestial nature. Uh, Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great, thine offspring as the grass of the earth, as the grass of the earth. So it's the grass and you have uh, people being referred to as grass. Now, one commentator that I read stated, he said, well, there's no plausible explanation has been given concerning the destruction of a third part. We, we don't know what that third part means. Well, I, I'll give you one. I think it means a third part. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and uh, the Greek there makes it clear that it is, uh, uh, it's clear that it's the hail and the fire that are mingled and that both together are sent in blood. Joel 2, uh, we read, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, uh, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. That's a verse that most of you are familiar with. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. See, see, you see, Steve, that's going to happen before uh, the church leaves or it's going to happen before the rapture. See, it happens before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And that's not what that says. Uh, it says before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, uh, there's two ways that I, I, I can take that personally but I can take that because it says the great and terrible day of the Lord that's referring to the great tribulation period or the latter half great being a reference to the great tribulation period the second half of the tribulation uh, not before the 70th week begins as many think 
Or you could take that as the gap between the rapture and the beginning of the uh, two witnesses ministry, the beginning of the, the first half, uh, which I believe, the, and I've pointed out in numerous videos, how I believe that there is a 30-day gap, gap which has to be accounted for, and the only place that that 30 days fits is in between the rapture and the beginning of the first 1260 days. So, but the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. To me, tells me that must be in the latter half of the tribulation period. So now we're into the trumpets. And I've just touched a little on the first trumpet. Uh, folks, this is really turning out to be a very interesting study, an eye-opener. It, it is, in my opinion, it's impossible for any one of us, including myself, especially myself, I have to include myself in this, to, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's impossible not to go through this and not see things that we haven't seen before. I have I have a, the tremendous challenge here to uh, not contradict myself. Uh, it, it is near to impossible for me to remember everything that I've said in previous videos. Uh, I'm going somewhere with this, if you just bear with me here a moment. Uh, I pointed out that I am no one's guru. I, I do not want you to f follow this channel uh, because you think I'm the best Bible teacher on the planet, because I'm certainly not. I don't want you to follow uh, along in what I believe. I don't want you to agree with me or believe what I believe just because I believe it. Uh, I don't want that either. Uh, I can at times be, be very dogmatic about what I believe, and at other times I can not be so dogmatic. Uh, my challenge is to, well, I am responsible for every word that I say. And there's, I, do, I don't want to teach fo error, folks. I'd rather die. And I don't want to contradict myself either. That's one reason why I believe it is important that someone such as myself has elders to uh, mature men who, whom God has given the wisdom of discernment in order to take and to where there's checks and balances, where I'm kept in check. I need you folks to point out to me where I've strayed off the... Off the uh, the right path, uh, uh, not the not the well trodden path, not the beaten path. I often stray off the beaten path, but but if if you see or if you think that I have erred in any way at all, I would I would uh, really appreciate you letting me know. Uh, you folks are helping me as much as uh, many of you claim that I'm helping you. Uh, I know that I'm not able to, to open your eyes to truth. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm just, you know, we're all, each one of us individually, we are instruments in, in the hands of our Master. He, 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 he may delight, He may choose in, in, uh, uh, in using us in some particular way. I, I believe that He's using us all in, in, our own unique way, a, a way that He has specifically designed and prepared f just for you and just for me. Uh, there's never a reason ever, ever, for you to feel like that, well, the Lord's really using this person, but He's not really using me. I, I would argue all day long that that is not the truth at all. You may not see how He's using you, but believe me, He is. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for your support, your prayers, your love, your messages, your kind words of encouragement, which keeps this ministry going. 
Until next time, stay safe, and thanks for watching.